Hi, I'm Dre, founder of Forecast Hope, creator of You Forecast Hope. I'm going to welcome you to one of our workshops where we discuss eight ways for you to develop your leadership skills. In this, we're going to go over just some techniques, both internally, externally, some soft, some hard, and we're really going to get into some of the nitty gritty that will help you when it comes to advancing your professional career. Because most professionals want to change something about their life, but they are discouraged by the fears and self-doubt that their false beliefs create. So I wanted to create a process to help you be confident in your abilities, accomplish your goals, so that you can become the champion of your life. So first on our list we have, you want to focus on helping others accomplish their goals first. And it's one of those tough things when it's talking about being a leader. And before we go into a lot of the questions of, well, I understand that, it sort of makes sense, it really comes down to how effective a leader you are is 100% tied to the people who are following you. So if you want to kind of build that environment, get the right people to follow, to listen, to go through brick walls for you, then you have to kind of give a little bit. And when you really think about being a leader, we often overlook the need to develop relationships. And so whenever you're networking, whenever you're kind of engaging and developing relationships, the very first thing that you want to do is ask, how can I help you? What is it that you are working on that I can be some assistance? And if you don't even ask, like maybe this isn't a new relationship, it's an established relationship and you just want to kind of revamp some things, just listen to some of the problems that they talk about. Whatever they say they're working on, whatever they say that um, seems to be a headache for them, see if you can use your network to bring them to someone else that can offer a solution, if not you offering the solution directly. Because you will find that being a great leader has a lot to do with helping other people accomplish their goals. Now, I'm not 100% sure who the saying is with, but they often say the amount of influence you have is directly tied to the amount of value that you're able to give to others. So when it comes to being an effective leader, you have to give that value to others. When it comes to getting people to follow and listen to you, you have to give that value. Let me ask you a question. Who is the person in your life that you would go through a brick wall for? And then I want you to think why. Most likely it's going to be like a parent, a spouse, a longtime friend, or someone maybe that you go to church with, something like that. Someone who has been there, who has invested in you. And as a result, you understand that when they ask you to do something, that they genuinely have your best interest in mind. And even if you're not 100% sure how it's going to help you, you know that they at least wouldn't do something that would hinder or um, stall the progress that you're trying to make in your life. And that's really just where you want to get. And that's why it's really important that you focus on how can I serve my followers by building these relationships, by fostering this trust in this environment. And number two is you just want to make sure that you're speaking with clarity and honesty. And I find that often whenever people have difficulties really speaking on what they're thinking about, they're really dealing with the fear of vulnerability and just the fear of uncertainty. And that's because you don't know how people are going to react. It's one of those weird things where we spend a lot of our time hoping that people will accept us for who we are, while at the same time, too scared to exhibit who we truly are because we all want to be accepted. We all want to be understood. And so it's really hard sometimes for us to step out on that limb and say what it is that we're thinking, to speak with that certainty and that clarity and honesty. Hey, you know what? I don't know what you're doing. I'm really at a loss for words. Can you please help me understand what's going on? Right? That's really hard for us because we have to be vulnerable to do that. But being a leader doesn't mean that you have to have all the answers. It doesn't even mean you have to be right all the time. Um, it really just means that you are going to be the one that is going to, I'll say, let's just keep people on the direction that they need to go. Right? And we don't want to say like herding cats or herding sheep, but the idea is there's a lot of great ideas. And your goal is to make sure that we can uh, implement as many as we can that help us to accomplish our overall objective. Because you really only have, I don't know, let's say two or three life huge goals that you're going to be able to accomplish within your given life. So think of that within your organization's life as well or within whatever function that you were leading in. 
you may only be able to accomplish like two or three really big things every year or one big thing every year. And if you allow a lot of these small ideas to kind of throw you off, then it's really going to hinder your overall growth. And the best way that you can make sure everybody stays on track is by speaking with clarity and honesty. Because if it's too vague, people will genuinely think that they're helping you out, but they're not because what you're thinking is completely different. And I've been in those environments where I remember uh, sitting with someone and in his mind, he had a very, um, uh, I'll say his experiences were, if you set goals and that is a negative thing. And when I taught him, I was like, well, there's you know, nothing inherently wrong with a goal. Can you explain to me what your concerns were? And he said, well, there's two things. One is it ends up creating these false expectations where it ends up creating a lot of resentment if you don't meet them. And either that resentment comes from you beating yourself up or from other people and their expectations of you, the goals that they put on you. And that causes some tension in your relationships. And I looked at him and I was like, yeah, that's that's true that that can happen. But that's not because of goals, right? That's because they made unrealistic goals. And there is a difference, right? If you teach people how to make realistic goals, then you can overcome this objection without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But because they didn't want to speak with clarity, they just had to say goals are bad. And it really becomes, well, okay, well, what do you want me to do then, right? Because if you look up the word goal, what is it? It's your destination. It's your end point. So if we don't have a destination, we don't have an end point, then how do we know whether we're on track or not? And I'm a big fan of goals because realistically, it helps you to make tweaks very early in the process. If you don't have a goal, then you're not going to understand how off you are until you're way off. Because there's no small variations. Like, let's say someone was like, you know what? I want to make sure that I save an extra $100 in our department every single month. Well, then you understand when the first month is over, or at least halfway into the month, and you're thinking, okay, we should maybe be at like $50 or somewhere around there. And if you're not, you're able to make some adjustments to see if you can fix that. But if you don't have a goal, if you're just going to say, I want to save our department money this year. Then maybe at the end of the first month, you have a dollar, maybe not. Maybe at the end of the second month, you have lost three dollars, but maybe that offsets with the first month, right? There's just no clarity in it. And so you want to make sure that you speak with that clarity. Don't allow any sort of fear of uncertainty or fear of uh, vulnerability to cloud your judgment. Clarity is definitely going to help you and your followers will completely understand exactly where you're at at all times and you cannot underestimate the value of knowing exactly where you stand with someone when it comes to being an effective uh, and influential leader number three is that you want to be a good follower and i sort of like touched on it slightly it's just the idea that you don't want to present yourself and make this extremely difficult standard where everything you say is right and everything that you say has to be the way it's done because realistically, none of us are perfect. And if you admit that none of us are perfect, then that surely means that that means that there is a better idea out there and you just have to encourage people to share it. So as long as you can be a good follower, and what I'm saying is the example that you want to set is the example that you want your followers to give. And you've seen it with like parents and kids. You've seen it with friends when they hang out, right? You show me who you hang out with and I can tell you something about yourself. And sometimes when you're a leader, there's some leaders who think the way that I treat you is not the way I want you to treat me. The, I think the way that the wording would be is that phrase is do as I say, not as I do. Well, how effective is that? Right. Realistically, it's going to create anything from tension, resentment, or it's going to create that environment where your subordinates, even though they may bite their tongue with you, when they're with their subordinates, they're going to act just like you. And I want that to be a great thing. I want that to be an encouragement. I want that to be a positive result for your or, or I want that to be a positive result for your organization and the goals that you are looking to accomplish. But if you can't be a good follower, if you always kind of, I don't know, throw out the title, let's just say that there's always that person in the meeting that it's very clear that they use their title to their advantage, that if the person has a lower title than them, 
then they just demolish them. They just steamroll them in every meeting. But if the person has a higher title than them, they always seem to co-sign their ideas. Now, I want you to think, how do you feel when you see someone do that? And I know how I feel. I feel like that person's a little sleazy, that they're a suck up, and that they don't have any integrity. And I may be harsh because that's just kind of the way that I was raised. I was raised that everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time. And that that simply means that none of us are any better than anyone and that we all have the ability to grow, we all have the ability to succeed, to fail, and to offer overall value. And that whenever you find someone dealing with this difficulty of being a good follower, they're often dealing with the fear of losing control. Because if you see your leadership as, I always have to be the person with the best idea, I always have to be the person that, um, you know, the buck stops with me, and I appreciate that. But I think a huge part of being a leadership is empowering those who are with you so that you are not the bottleneck of your growth. Because realistically, if you're in a large organization where we're talking 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 people have to get your okay on something, well, then you're the problem. And it's not that you are a problem. It's just that you've set yourself up for failure. And so you really want to understand that there's no reason to fear losing control, that the butt can still stop with you, but that also means that you want to empower and give the authority to other people. And we'll have a video where we talk about some of the teamwork building um, strategies as well as some of the overall accountability structures that you can put in so that you can save your time to focus on the stuff that truly matters um, for you. Not to say that their work doesn't matter, but just to say it doesn't matter for you. And so I just want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind and understand that your goal is to put the right people on your team so that you can trust them and empower them to do their job. And then you train them in the way that they need to go. Number four, we have adopt a growth mindset. And before we get into all the hoopla about the way everybody uses the word growth today, because I've heard growth used in a manner where it's like, you will make millions of dollars overnight. Mm, that's not what growth mindset is. I've heard it used in the manner where it's going to be like, Anything that you want to do, you'll be able to accomplish it tomorrow. We're getting closer, but that's still not what a growth mindset is. A growth mindset is the understanding that I have the ability to grow and foster whatever skills I need to accomplish my goals. It's that simple. It's not as beautiful, it's not as fancy, but that's really what a growth mindset is. When you see other people use it in another manner, they're just really doing that marketing and sales, and I get it. They're speaking to a side of us that we all have where it's like easy, save time, get results, make more money, blah, 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 blah. But you all know that that opens you up to be taken advantage of. Like I can remember, I can remember in college where I wanted some money that I looked in um, some entrepreneur books and I was looking in some of the ads that they had and it was like, make a thousand dollars a month by mailing envelopes and we'll give you all the supplies and the stamps and everything else. And I was like, oh my goodness, I can make $1,000 a month while going to school by just mailing stuff and they give me all the supplies. So I got it and I was excited, you know, I paid like 40 bucks or something for it. And they mailed me some junk, but it was nothing like the way that I thought it was. And you often find that if you believe that something can be kind of gained quickly, happen overnight, then you have to open yourself up to the people that speak to that part of you. Because oftentimes, the people who are honest who are saying, you know what, this is going to take time and it's not going to be easy, but we can definitely get there. That doesn't sound as sexy, but you often you also know that that person is more trustworthy and that person is being more honest and that they're not just speaking to the side of you. Anytime I see a video where someone's like sitting in front of a Lamborghini, I immediately click skip because I know that they're speaking to a side of me that I don't want to be listening and that's just me. I'm not saying that if you do that, if you're like, well, Dre, I just had a video where I stood in front of my Lamborghini because I want people to understand that what I say is, is truthful, that it gets results. I can appreciate that. But I want you to also understand that there's a lot of people who are doing that same thing and they're not doing it for the same reason as you. And so it's easier for me just to turn all of it off. And so I'm just going to be honest with you about that. So anyways, understanding that a growth mindset is the ability that you can 
foster and build and grow and learn whatever you need to accomplish your goals, then the opposite is also a fixed mindset. And it's just basically the idea that you are either born with it or you're not. That there is nothing I can do, that I got a deck of cards, I look at C, and if I got five, um, if I got four aces, then great. If I just got like a bunch of random cards, then I'm just gonna give up. I'm just gonna live whatever mediocre, not a, uh, pursuing my purpose life that I can have. And you'll find that whenever people are dealing with avoiding a growth mindset, that they're often dealing with the fear of, of course, losing control. Because when it comes to growing and learning, then you're going to have to rely on other people. They're also dealing with just the fear of change. Well, I want to change some things, but I don't want to change everything. Like how much do I have to change for a growth mindset? And they're also just dealing with the fear of uncertainty that I can't do it today. And if I invest all this time and money, well, what happens if I don't accomplish that? How do I look to my peers and my superiors? And these are all strong and very um, thought provoking questions. But at the end of the day, these are all fears and doubt that is keeping you from creating the life that you want. And you have to understand that you must leave your comfort zone if you were to have any hope at creating your dream life. And it really is that simple. And a part of this starts with being an effective leader. So number five, we have on our list that you want to ask questions. And I'm a huge question asker. It's actually one of my superpowers. I often take it for granted because that's me. I've always been a big question asker. But as I started coaching uh, professionals and executives and accomplishing their goals, I find that my ability to ask questions really helps us to hone the conversations. And a lot of that just genuinely has to do with a healthy sense of curiosity. I'm genuinely interested in what you have to say that I'm like, I want to know so much more so I can ask a lot of questions. And a lot of the times when we're not asking questions, we're concerned about what we're going to say next. So we don't want to be caught off guard with that awkward moment of silence, but silence is not a bad thing. Silence is where the magic happens. Sil um, silence, boredom, things like that. It's overstimulation that hinders growth and innovation. So if you have the ability to turn the TV off, to sit in some silence with some people, you'll be surprised at what you're able to think of, what you're able to create. And that's why meditation is so powerful. And I'm telling you, there's like, hundreds of studies on meditation. So if you, if you haven't started it, I totally encourage you to get started because it genuinely works. No exaggeration, no nonsense, just taking the moment to allow yourself to collect your thoughts. For me, meditation means that I sit and allow myself to complete all my open-ended thoughts where I was like, oh, what was I going to say? Mm, I forgot. Well, if I sit long enough, I can remember. If I'm like, oh, I'll do that later, I sit and I think of it. And sometimes I find stuff that I lost where I'm like, oh yeah, that's where I dropped it. We're just going so fast that we don't allow ourselves to ever process all this information, right? We're just kind of going in cruise control. And so I often find that that helps a lot. And whenever people are um, nervous about asking questions, they're dealing with two fears, a fear of vulnerability, because anytime you ask a question, you don't know how it's gonna be received. It may be the best question ever. People may think that it was the dumbest question ever. That's really hard. And then that leads into the just the fear of being judged, where you're like, look, if I don't say anything, then no one can judge whether or not I'm competent, whether I understand what's going on. But if I ask a question, then I just don't know what's going to happen. And so you can sort of even hear the fear of uncertainty a little bit in there. But generally speaking, it has a lot to do with just putting yourself out there. It goes back to when we were kids in school where the teacher asked a question and almost everybody did not say anything. But you knew the answer. When they said the answer, you're like, man, I, I knew that. I should have said something. But why didn't you? Because you were nervous about what if I'm wrong. And so you just really want to, um, I'd say, understand that you have these fears and then don't allow them to continue to change your actions. And when you talk about being an effective leader, the way that you ask questions is how you keep everybody on track, is how you keep everybody accountable. And if you don't do that, then you'll find that it's very difficult to keep the vision focused. If you're just listening and you're not willing to put yourself out there, then it almost is like you're agreeing in silence, right? If you disagree, you'll say something, so then maybe you agree with me. 
Like, I don't really know. And then that talks back on being just honest and clear about what's going on at all times. It's really important for the leader to keep everybody on mission, keep everybody focused. And so you have to lead by that example and you have to be willing to put yourself out there because again, you're not putting your standard at being perfect. You're just putting the standard as staying focused. That my job is to keep us focused and I can do that. It has nothing to do with me being right all the time, having the best idea or being perfect. I'm just the person who's gonna ask the questions Make sure we're focused. Make sure we're focusing on the number one goal for our year so that we're able to achieve the overall results. Because there's nothing worse than being wasting a year on a whole bunch of small, little, insignificant goals that make you feel good in the short term. But then in December, you're like, man, we missed the goal. And I don't want that to happen for you. Number six is you want to be a problem solver. Simply to be an agent of change, you have to get away from blaming where people are always trying to cover their butt. And that makes organizations very, um, I say, where it's siloed and they don't trust each other. Because why am I going to tell you anything if I feel that you're going to use it against me? Or, right, on the other end where you're like, okay, if I like all of your ideas and I just take credit for them, well, then that goes against the first rule where you want to help them accomplish their goals. And generally speaking, your people want recognition, they want pay, and they want appreciation, right? I think that there's probably tons of surveys out there that confirm that there's lots of different things, but generally speaking, those are kind of like three on the three on the high list, or high on the <laughs> three high on the list. You get what I'm trying to say. And I think also you find integrity because people like prestige and integrity. They like to be able to tell people what they do for a living. Right. So you want to make sure that you kind of have that as well. But that one's probably slightly out of your control, but just something for you to know. So you want to make sure that as a problem solver, that you're not focused on blaming people and that you're always focused on getting the solution, the overall results. You don't care who gets credit for it. You really don't honestly care if who takes the blame for it. Now, if you want to get bonus points, then you'll be willing to take the blame for some stuff that maybe you didn't 100 percent have to do with. But I guarantee you, if you want to encourage and foster a relationship of following, guarantee you that if you take a bullet for your team, it will um, it will build that trust that we were talking about that you have with like your family or friends over years. Nothing is kind of greater than self-sacrifice. Insert your favorite superhero movie here. And it's like, oh, you're a jerk, you're a jerk, you're a jerk. Oh, they almost like died for me. Wow, you're awesome. It just happens like that in movies. And as someone who reads tons of comics, watches all the comic movies, loves mangas, then you already know that that is the recipe for a good movie, a good redemption story for sure. Right? I mean, everything where Star Wars, where, where Luke is messing with Anakin, and then Anakin takes out the Emperor, and then Luke's like, whoa, that's my dad. And you're like, yeah, that's your dad. Good job, Anakin. And if you go with like cars, because I have four daughters, then that would be where he like lets the cup go and he goes back to help the old car. And they're like, oh, it's just an empty old cup anyways. Right. Like that is the magic when it comes to uh, being a leader and getting people to follow your lead. And self-sacrifice is a great way to do that. And number seven, we have awareness and you just want to observe and learn. And there's actually um, a study out there, I think Villanova, where the last two actually come from a Villanova study. And they talked about awareness, which is the overall idea that you are taking account of everything that's going on. And whether that is what people are saying versus what they're doing, whether that is the processes and how you can improve them, whether that is the people who are doing most of the work, because if you um, study some of the 80-20 stuff where it will help you on some productivity, and I'll, I'll make a video for that too, where it's basically 80% of your results is coming from 20% of your people. And so if you empower those 20%, then you can amplify the results that they create. And then that rule kind of goes into some other stuff where it's like 20% of your customers create 80% of your revenue, 20% of the people in the group do 80% of the work. I mean, you just go down the list. So if you're aware of these things, then some of it you may be able to prune where it's like, look, I don't want these people to burn up because they're being taken advantage of by the slackers. I want to see if I can build up some of these slackers. 
And because of things like the 80-20 rule, I can honestly tell you that you most likely will just end up having to find something else for those people to do. Like maybe they're in the wrong job or they're in the wrong profession or they're doing the wrong thing or whatever it is that most likely there's some sort of a disconnect and that you have to find something else that they're engaged and excited about. But you want to do that versus the other option, which is you allow your 20% doing the 80% to fall into the 80% doing the 20% because they feel like nothing is going on, like nothing's clicking. And a lot of this has to do with self-awareness. And when it comes to persuasion and when it comes to sales or, or really anything at all, communication, a big one, if you are self-aware and if you have an overall awareness, then you're reading body language. You're listening to the words that they use, where there are studies that say that people who are visual learners use phrases like, I see what you're saying, right? Like they use the words to let you know how to communicate with them. Or another one may be, I hear you, right? And that person's an audio learner. Or someone is like, I feel like, then you know that they would appreciate a pat on the back, a literal pat on the back, that touch means a lot to them. And then you'll find some people that have a mixture of all of them. And then that is a completely different conversation. But it's just the idea that if you focus on the awareness where the best word I could guess I can think of is mindfulness, where you're literally in the moment. You're not too far in the future. You're not too far in the past. You're right here and now. You'll find that you're able to make the best decisions available because you are all in on what the people are talking about. And you're able to hear those little things. You're able to see those little things. And this awareness is going to help you in your leadership because you're going to be a more effective leader. Again, a lot of the mistakes that a lot of us make is we're so focused on how we're going to respond that we're not listening to what the person is actually saying. And I don't want you to be in that boat. So I definitely encourage you to build your awareness by just being mindful of the moment. Whatever they're saying, whatever's going on in their life, Make a small note when you get back to your desk and then follow up on that. Be like, hey, you mentioned that your dog was sick. How did that surgery go? Oh, you went to Disney World with your kids. Did you take any pictures? Did What was their favorite ride? Hey, you mentioned that there may be a better way to do this one thing that we always do at work. Did you have time to talk to me about it now? Right. This is all a part of just being aware where you are actually paying so much attention to what they're saying that, A, they know you care, which we've already talked about is super important when it comes to being a leader that has followers. And B, it's going to help you get the results that you want because you're able to recognize a lot more things before it becomes an uh, issue. I'm a big proponent of teaching people to react to the, uh, not to react, that's even the wrong word. I like to teach people to be proactive in the sense that you don't want to be always responding to the lagging indicators, right? There's some very obvious things when we know that someone's disengaged with their job, but if you're a proactive, then maybe you have, let's say, a, a lunch once a month, or you just have an open door policy, but you still follow up with them. Hey, is there anything that you want to talk about this week where you're able to get that information out because you don't want to be the leader that's like, I'm really surprised that you're not happy here. I'm very surprised that you applied for another job or giving me your two weeks notice. I didn't know this was going on. Sometimes that is on them. 100% is not always on you. They are great at faking it. But sometimes it's on you. Sometimes you had the signs and you just weren't able to see them. And that leads us nicely into number eight, which is just effective communication. And if, as I mentioned, this was also on that Villanova uh, study where it talked about some traits of leadership. I think they listed like five, but communication is pretty high on the list. And the reason communication is, is because it's all about what I'm trying to get done, how you perceive what I'm trying to get done and what I'm saying versus what you think I'm saying. And the tone that I use and the words of choice that I make, and it all plays a huge role in whether you get the results that you want. And as a leader, you have tons of personalities. You have tons of different interests and tons of uh, different excitement levels and experience levels and all sorts of information that you have to kind of process and spit out in a way that makes sense for each individual person. 
that some people love the stories and they really enjoy you to see how they're doing and have the long conversations. Some people like the short and to the point story um, without the stories because it's really important for them to understand what you need for them because they want to go get that done. And then there's people all over the place. So you, you know, if you've ever done those Meyer Briggs or different things, right? There's people who like to be left alone, like tech jobs and accounting where they're not big on chit chat. And then there's people who are in like sales and, and they enjoy talking to people and going out to lunch and just kind of catching up on things. And then you have the leaders and you have the leaders who are direct and they can be kind of brash and they really don't like a lot of the extra fluff. And then you also have the people who kind of corral everyone. They want to get everybody's thoughts. They want to make sure everybody feels involved and how people feel is really important to them. And so you just want to make sure that that you understand your people and that you understand yourself. You want to make sure that your preferred way of communicating is in line with their preferred way of receiving. And then they also understand your preferred way of communication so they can communicate with you that way. Um, there's a scripture that basically says that you do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. And sometimes I think the mistake that we make is we think that that means I want to be spoken direct, clearly, and concisely. So that means I should speak to you clearly, directly, and concisely. Well, no. Technically, I want to be spoken to the way that I want to be spoken to. And you want to be spoken to the way that you want to be spoken to. So for me to treat you the way you want to be treated, I need to speak with you the way that you want to be spoken to, not the way that I want to be spoken to. That's really what it means. And I think sometimes we miss that where we're so focused on what I want that we really overlook it's not about us. To treat someone else the way that we want to be treated is to actually treat them the way that they want to be treated. And so you really want to make sure that you focus in on communication, that you really invest in these conversations, in this relationship. And a good way to make sure you're always on the same page is just to really ask questions, like don't make assumptions. Where someone says, hey, we're, we're down like $10,000 year over year, and you, you think that you know why, or you think that they don't know why, well, just ask them, have you looked into that at all? Do you have any recommendations on how we can turn this around? Um, should we change our forecast, right? Do you think this is worth sharing with, you know, someone else on the team? However, the questions you want to go, that genuine curiosity that, that I want to understand what you're talking about. Hey, thanks for bringing this to me, that appreciation. It goes a long way. And if you want to be an effective leader, you really have to make sure that your people understand that you care about their input and that you value the work that they do. And then you want to make sure that you get them there to achieve their goals. And that's really kind of what it comes down to. And when you talk about effective communication, it really has to do with the overall desire that I want what is best for you. And so when people have a lack of communication, generally speaking, is the fear of inadequacy. Like I don't want to come off like I know less, so I don't want to say anything. It has to do with the fear of the worst case scenario where you're sitting there and you're thinking, if we go down this road where we just have this back and forth, it may make them look smarter than me. It may expose me in some way or they may waste a lot of my time. Whatever it is you're thinking like, this could be the worst case scenario. So let me just nix it right now. Just the overall fear of rejection, failure, missing out. I mean, you name it. Communication is so vast and it's tied to so many different things that it makes it really hard to truly understand exactly why effective communication happens. But I can tell you effective or ineffective, but I can tell you effective communication is driven by selflessness and an overall desire to understand what that person is going on. And so I'll just recap the eight ways to develop your leadership skills. Number one is you want to focus on helping them accomplish their goals. Number two is you want to speak with clarity and honesty. Number three is you want to be a good follower. Number four is you want to adapt a growth mindset. Number five is you want to ask questions. Six is be a problem solver. Seven is overall awareness, both self and outside. And eight is effective communication. And again, I'm Dre, the founder of Forecast Hope, creator of You Forecast Hope, the letter U. And I encourage you to go to youforecasthope.com if you want to learn more about this. It's a free membership level 
where we focus on helping and coaching professionals to change their life so they can get the results that they want. And in there will be everything from live coaching, um, live confidence coaching sessions to book reviews, because I read a lot where I talk about some of the strategies that I've seen to even a uh, lucky winner we get a hot seat um, mastermind session where we really go deep on whatever the goal is that you have in your life. Again, I'm Dre, I'm your mindset coach and mentor change, and I want to wish you continued blessings on your journey to become the champion of your life.